<sighs> All right, we'll go ahead and get started. I know a lot of people are sick. Um, John Loudon, they had to take him to the hospital yesterday, struggling to breathe. Um, he's got he's got the flu, just like everybody else has had. Eric's still trying to recover. My son's still trying to recover. I still ain't fully recovered. And uh, Dr. Dave uh, messaged me earlier this week and told me he had the flu now. And uh, I know Adrian and his family have been sick. They had COVID about a month ago, and then they got the flu. And so uh, just be in prayer for everybody. That's why not many people here this morning. But... Uh, it's tough to get over, isn't it? Yeah. You used to feel like you're getting better, and then the next day you wake up and you're like, what in the world? <laughs> but uh, I decided to take both services this morning to try to make some headway into this study on the book of Matthew. And uh, right here in our outline, we're in this section right here. Uh, it runs from chapter one, and it runs into chapter one and chapter two. And in this section, you have the record of the genealogy and birth of the king of Israel, the king of the Jews. Wise men came saying, where is he born king of the Jews? And a Gentile governor plastered over his cross. Here's Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. Amen. Amen. Pilate asked him, shall I crucify your king? <laughs> You think Pilate knows? Sounds like he knew to me. I mean, we have no king but Caesar. It's like Dr. Ruckman said one time. You have no king but Caesar. God said, you want Caesar? I'll give you Caesar. Hey Amen. I'll give you Caesar. You want Caesar? I'll give you Caesar. You know, you know, just about every one of the SS and the Gestapo and the Nazis were baptized Roman Catholics. Hey Amen. Have no king but Caesar. Now, we're dealing with the last week we, we looked at the genealogy, but I didn't get into this stuff that I want to get into this morning. And that's this phrase right here. The son of David, the son of Abraham. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. This lineage links this man, the Lord Jesus Christ, back to specific promises that God made to two men, Abraham and David, about their seed. God made promises thousands of years in advance concerning the seed of these two men, David and Abraham. And that's what we're going to look at here in the Sunday school hour. So we're going to go back and look at the promises that God made to Abraham and to David concerning their son and their seed. Now, beginning here in Genesis chapter 15, God has already called Abraham out of his father's house. He's already made promises to him. He said, I will make of thee a great nation. Uh, he said, I will, I will bless thee and thou shalt be a blessing and all these things. And he's going to give him this land, which he talks about in Genesis chapter 15. But Abraham's just coming out of a war in Genesis chapter 14. Abraham went and slaughtered a bunch of kings and rescued Lot and his, his family from those kings. And they tried to give Abraham the spoils of war. And he said, I won't take anything except what the men have eaten. He said, lest any man say, I've made Abraham rich. He won't take a thing. Very next chapter, after these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision saying, fear not, Abram. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. That's enough for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amen. If you've got God as your shield and your great reward, you have more than you'll ever need. Amen. Yeah. And Abram said, Lord God, watch this now. What wilt thou give me seeing I go childless and the steward of my house is this Eleazar of Damascus uh, seeing I go childless and the steward, I don't have that written down right, I don't think. Flip over and read it. feel like I left something out there. Uh, 
No, I didn't. All right. And the steward of my house is this Eleazar of Damascus. And Abraham said, Behold, to me thou hast given no what? And lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. See that? That's a promise God made to Abraham that, that a seed out of his own bowels is going to be his heir. And so God promised Abraham an heir out of his own bowels. Amen? Yeah. Now do you understand this? <clears throat> Amen? That's the promise, that's the heir that God promised Abraham. You know how I know? God got this man up from the dead. He didn't get Isaac up from the grave, nor Jacob, nor Judah, nor David, nor Solomon, nor any of them. He got this man out of the grave. And you, you, say, you say, why does he have to get him out of the grave for him to be the heir? Because God's going to make some promises about an everlasting possession and an everlasting covenant. You can't do that stuff if you're dead in the ground. How are you going to possess something forever if you're dead? Amen? These promises are about one man. Amen? He says, this man is not going to be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. Now keep up. Because Paul said in Galatians 3.16, now to Abraham and his what? Were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one and to thy seed, which is who? So Paul says that Jesus Christ is that seed of Abraham. Nobody else. Amen? Now watch. We're going to see what God promises Abraham here. Genesis 17, now he comes to him. After the whole Ishmael fiasco. Right? Right? And after 13 years of silence, God shows up and begins to speak to Abraham again. And he tells him here, neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. Now we've, I've, I've mentioned this multiple times. When you understand what God did right here with his name, he breathed the syllable of his name into Abraham's name. Now y'all get over there and re you read Romans chapter four and you know what it says about Abraham? That he reckoned, he, he considered not his own body, now what? Dead. So what was God, what was Abraham trusting in? He was trusting in God that quickeneth the dead. When God changes his name here, it's just like he did to Adam. He breathed. He breathed and added the syllable of his name, Yah. To Abraham's name. Amen? You getting the picture, guys? Now, he removes that syllable off of one of David's sons. We ain't going to get into that, but just notice this. Thy name shall be Abraham. Why? For a father of many nations have I made thee. This is why Paul said he calleth those things that are not as though they are. This is a childless man. With a barren wife. And God said, I've made you a father of many nations. Not I will, I have. When God says he's going to do something, it's done. He's not man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should repent. I have made you a father of many nations. Now watch. And I will make thee exceeding what? How's he going to do that? With that seed. <laughs> Y'all know you can't get fruit without planting a seed. And so this one seed of Abraham that God has now breathed into Abraham and said, I've made you a father of many nations and I will make thee exceeding fruitful. Well, what's going to come out of Abraham? Right here's the fruit. Watch. And I will make what? Nations of thee and kings shall come out of thee. So what is God going to produce out of Abraham? Nations and kings. 
the fruit of Abraham, the fruit, that seed is going to come. And from that seed, God is going to make nations and kings out of Abraham. Amen. Y'all ever read the end of your Bible? Thou hast made us kings and priests unto our God. You ever read Revelation 21? The nations of them which are saved and the kings of those nations bring their glory into that city? Huh? You know what God tells them there in Revelation 21? That his tabernacle is with men and he will be their God and they shall be his people. Look, look down here at the end of this verse. And I will be their what? There it is. Now it's been 4,000 years, but I, you better bet your bottom dollar it's still good. Amen? You ain't got to worry about it. Look at what he says. I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee for what? Everlasting covenant. Well, it ain't the Mosaic. Was the Mosaic covenant an everlasting covenant? No. Nope. Notice who he's going to make the covenant with. Notice this now, guys. This is very important stuff. People just skim over this stuff. I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their what? What does that mean? It means in their families. <laughs> right? Now God's getting ready to tell him to circumcise himself. This is this everlasting covenant's going to be made with the people of the circumcision. It's going to be made with them in their generations for an everlasting covenant. Now notice what he says. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting what? So y'all getting this? Y'all getting these promises made to Abraham? What do they deal with? They deal with an everlasting covenant and an everlasting possession of a piece of land. And this covenant is going to be made with Abraham and his seed in their generations. Amen. There's a family that proceeded out of Abraham. Right? Now, everlasting covenant, everlasting possession. Who's he going to make the everlasting covenant with? His seed. Who's he going to give the land to? His seed. Do you know do you know who the you know who these two things are about right here? Jesus Christ. Nobody else. Amen. Now we're going we're going to see we're getting ready to see something about multiplying. But first get this. God said unto Abraham, thou shalt keep my covenant therefore. Because of these promises, now he tells Abraham to keep my covenant. That means God made a covenant with Abraham before the law. Circumcision was before the law. This is a covenant. Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore, thou and thy seed after thee in their what? Generations. This is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. circumcised. Right? So what is circumcision? Circumcision is a covenant between God and Abraham's family. Now, people like us, the uncircumcision, we were aliens and strangers to that family. Amen? But this, this is specific to the people. I'm going to write this up here now. The people of circumcision. That right there is a token of this stuff right here. Right? Now, 
When Jesus Christ came to this earth, what was he? A minister of who? For the truth of what? To confirm what? So Jesus Christ was a minister to these people right here to confirm these promises that were made to them. Amen? This is why, this is why Gentiles spending every Sunday, uh, it sounds funny because we're in the book of Matthew, <laughs> but Gentiles spending every Sunday in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John thinking that those things are about them and trying to get to heaven based on the doctrine of those books is complete foolishness and folly and ignorance of scripture. Amen. Point blank period. Paul said in Romans 15, 16, pay close attention to what I'm about to say. Romans 15, 16, that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to you Gentiles ministering the gospel of God that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. There's only one ministry that makes you Gentiles acceptable unto God being sanctified and set apart by the Holy Ghost and it's the ministry of the Apostle Paul. Amen, brother. End, of the, end of discussion. That's biblical authority. It's written right there in black and white, Romans 15, 16. This seed of Abraham came to confirm the promises that were made unto the fathers. Amen? Now, Christ was a minister of the circumcision. What about Peter? Who was Peter? Who's, who, what was Peter's apostleship of? See it? What was Peter? What gospel was committed unto Peter? Now people's like, well, what, what does that mean? Well, I guess you better go back and read your Bible. Oh, it just means, oh yeah, go ahead and tell me, big boy. I know exactly what it means. Circumcision is a token and a sign of a covenant between God and a family on this earth concerning a covenant and a possession of a land. That's what circumcision is. And Christ came as a minister of that people to confirm those promises and Peter was given a gospel and apostleship to that people about the confirmation of those promises. Amen. Amen. You getting this stuff? Why you get so upset, preacher? Because for every preacher telling the truth, there's 300 don't know up from down. Amen? Genesis 22 and 2. Isaac now. <laughs> His only son. You say... Isaac wasn't his only son. Yeah, he was. Ishmael got the boot. Ishmael's been cast out. The only son that, J that Abraham has is Isaac. Look at what God tells him to do now. Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Notice, notice that phrase right there. Remember when God first come to Abraham, he said, get thee to a land that I will show thee. Now right here he says, get here to one of these mountains which I will tell thee of. <laughs> God's getting ready to tell Abraham about a mountain. Amen? Guys, this story right here is one of the great stories of the word of God. One in which you should spend some time looking at the details of it. Because there are many there. Abraham and Isaac is a picture of God the Father and, the, and God the Son. Christ being offered. That seed of Abraham being offered as a burnt offering unto God. It's a picture. God's going to tell Abraham of this mountain in which his son is going to be offered as a burnt offering and a sacrifice for sin. There's two men that go with them. 
And they get, they get close to the mountain and Abraham says, y'all stay here, me and the son will go up on the mountain and worship alone. And after we're done, we'll come back to you. Abraham don't have a doubt in his mind that Isaac's coming off that mountain with him. Amen. Why? Because he believes God. Every promise God made him is in this son right here. Abraham says, if I kill him, God has to raise him from the dead. He don't have a doubt in his mind at this point. Amen? You say, what do those two men represent? I believe they represent the law and the prophets that witness these things afar off. And it, the Bible says, on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. Say, so what's that mean? Well, go back to the third day of creation. What happened on the third day? The dry land appeared. And when that dry land appeared, God the Father saw that mountain upon which his son was going to be offered. Amen. Abraham and Isaac start going up the mountain and Isaac says, Father, I see. Now he laid the wood on Isaac and he took the fire. The fire pictures wrath. That wood which that fire is going to consume pictures the sins of the world being laid down upon him. And Abraham takes the knife and the fire in his hands and they go up the mountain. And on the way up, Isaac says, Father, I see the wood and I see the fire, but where's the lamb? There's the question of humanity. Where's the lamb? John the Baptist answered it about 4,000 years later. Behold the lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. 2,000 years. I'm off about 2,000 years there. But behold the lamb which taketh away the sins of the world. They get up on the mountain. Abraham tells him, my son, God will provide himself a lamb. Amen. And he's ready to kill him the angel of the Lord calls out to him and says Abraham harm not the lad for now I know that thou fearest God seeing thou hast not withheld thine only son from me and Abraham turned and looked behind him and there was a ram caught in the thicket there God provided a ram in the stead of Isaac in other words Abraham I'm going to provide a burnt offering in the stead of Isaac Amen. God was going to provide. You know what Abraham called that mountain? The provision of Jehovah. And he says, as it is said to this day, in the mountain of the Lord it shall be seen. In other words, y'all keep an eye on this mountain. Because in this mountain, God's provision is going to be seen. Amen. Now, pay close attention to what I'm about to show you. Pay close attention to this now, guys, because that's the seed. And that seed's going to come, and that only seed and that only son of Abraham is going to be offered to God for a burnt offering upon this mountain. Now look at what he says. God says, by myself have I sworn, saith the Lord. Well, then you can take it to the bank. Amen? God swears by himself. For because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee and in multiplying I will multiply thy what? Ooh. That seed, that single seed of Abraham is going to be multiplied. You know what Christ said in John chapter 12? He said, except the corn of wheat go into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it go into the ground and die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Amen. He's saying, if I don't go into the ground and die, then I'm by myself. But if I go into the ground and die, I'll bring forth much fruit. Amen. God took that seed of Abraham and he multiplied it as the stars of heaven. And as the sand which is upon the seashore, 
and thy seed, get it now, thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. God is going to take that one single man and multiply him and through that multiplication of that man, he's going to take possession of the gate of his enemies. Now we know it's even greater than what was ever thought. Because this seed of the Lord Jesus Christ is actually going to possess two realms. Heaven and earth. Amen. As Daniel 7, 18 says, the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess it. Amen. Now he's saying here, what he's saying here is that this seed, that once it's multiplied, that seed is going to take possession of the governments of their enemies. The gate, that word gate there signifies the seat of government. Amen? Amen. When, when, when Jacob sees Bethel and he sees that ladder there, he says, this is the house of God and the gate of heaven. Lot set in the gate of Sodom judging the people. And so God is saying this seed here is going to take possession of the governments of his enemies. <laughs> Amen. That's your calling, guys. Now, it's not this right here. But you're a part of a mystery of Christ. Amen. If you be Abraham, if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's what? And heirs according to the what? There it is. You're that seed. Wow. Christ in you, the hope of what? There it is. We are bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. We are the multiplication of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 <laughs> I love this stuff, guys. Now, we know that this seed and its fruit is going to possess heaven and earth and reconcile and subdue all things back to the authority of God the Father in heaven. Thank you. Amen. Now this seed, y'all understand it now. That seed of Abraham is going to come. He's going to be offered as a burnt offering and through that God is going to multiply that seed. But now this deals with Israel here, this everlasting covenant and this everlasting possession, which we're going to get into here shortly. But that seed line goes Isaac, Jacob, Judah, Pharez, Hezron, Ram, Amenadab, Nashon, Salmon, Boaz, Obed, Jesse, David, the king. That's the seed line. Fourteen generations from Abraham to David. Right? Then God comes along and starts talking to David about his seed. Amen? So the seed of Abraham is going to come and be offered as a burnt offering. The seed of David, when God starts making promises to David, it looks forward to after the resurrection. And all that God is going to accomplish through the Lord Jesus Christ after he's offered and God raises him from the dead. Now you're looking towards the millennial kingdom, the second coming and things of that nature. Now look at what he says here. When thy days be fulfilled and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels. Sounds like what, how God taught to Abraham, don't it? And I will establish his what? He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom for how long? Now we're dealing with an everlasting throne, ain't we? An everlasting throne. So the Lord Jesus Christ gets an everlasting covenant, everlasting possession of a land, and an everlasting throne to sit on. Amen. <laughs> Amen. God must think highly of him. Yeah. Amen. He gave me, he gave me and you 70 years. Yeah. 
if we're lucky. Right? <laughs> but now notice this right here. I will be his father and he shall be my what? Go back now. What's he say right here? For an everlasting possession and right here. An everlasting covenant to be a what? Unto thee and to thy what? Get it now. I will be his what? He shall be my what? You know what Paul called him? The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I bow my knees unto the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory. I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Now, when Christ came into the world, now you got to understand this. We're, we're going from, from Christ not just being the seed of Abraham and, and all being offered there unto God as a burnt offering, but God is saying that this man is going to be my son. Amen? And so what's going to be offered in the stead of Isaac? The son of God. Amen? You know when that takes place? Psalm 22. You ever read it? Genesis 22 is when God tells Abraham, why wouldn't you think God put it in Psalm 22? Y'all with me? Psalm 22 and 1, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You get it? You know the last thing he says? Father, into thine hands I commend my spirit. He cries out, my God, my God, as the sin offering. But when it's all said and done, he says, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. <laughs> uh -huh. That book is something else, man. Something else. 22nd Psalm, they've pierced my hands and my feet. You know what the 22nd Psalm is? That's the son of Abraham, the son of David, and the son of God being offered upon the mountain that he told Abraham about. Prophetically. Amen? Now, get this now, watch this. I will be his father, he shall be my son. But now notice what God's going to do for him. I will establish his, what? Yeah. Establish it, meaning I will set it up. Now watch this. He, the one whose kingdom is established. Notice the number one agenda of this kingdom is to build a house for the name of God. When Christ comes back, you better believe. Number one agenda is a house for the God of Israel. And all nations are going to come into that house and learn the ways of God. I don't think a whole lot about any politician that's not like that right there. Amen? You give me charge of the school system. First item of business, King James Bible in every classroom. Amen, brother. Yeah. Give me control of America and see how, oh, but you don't, yeah, uh-huh. How's this religious freedom treating you? Huh? Jesus Christ will set it in order when he comes. There won't be no, oh, what about our rights? Rod of iron, boom. <laughs> Dr. Ruckman used to say he's going to be the greatest military dictator the world has ever seen. He ain't playing. <laughs> yeah, he ain't playing. He's coming with a rod of iron to break the nations and to bring them in subjection to righteousness to God. 
going to be no about the rights of man and all this other nonsense. Man's had 6,000 years to prove he's incapable of doing anything right. He's going to build a house for God. When God establishes His kingdom, He's going to build God a house. I think about David over there. Psalm 100, look at Psalm 132. Psalm 132. You want to know why God loved David? He loved Abraham. He loved David. He called Abraham his friend. <laughs> I love that. Look at Psalm 132, verse 1. Lord, remember David and all his afflictions, how he swear unto the Lord and vowed unto the mighty God of Jacob. Surely I will not come into the tabernacle of my house, nor go up into my bed. I will not give sleep to mine eyes or slumber to mine eyelids until I find out a place for the Lord, a habitation for the mighty God of Jacob. You think God didn't have respect for David? Over there, over there in the book of Samuel, David says, I dwell in a house of cedar and the, and the ark of God dwelleth in a tent. David's like, shame on us that we came into this land and started building big houses of cedar and the ark of God still sitting over there in a tent. God says, David, you're not going to build my house, but I promise you, your seed is that will come out of your bowels. I will establish his kingdom and he'll build my house. Amen? Look there in verse 11. The Lord has sworn in truth unto David. He will not turn from it. This is part of the Davidic promise now. Of the fruit of thy body will I set upon thy throne. You know what Jesus Christ is? Jesus Christ is the fruit of David. The fruit of David. But when he sets upon that throne, guess who he is? God. Amen. Look, read that again. Of the fruit of thy body will I set upon thy throne. Do you know what the you know what the throne of Jerusalem is? You know what the throne of David is? It's the throne of the Lord. It's what it is. And it's a place. It's a throne that God and man is going to share. When the man, Christ Jesus, sets upon that throne, God is setting upon that throne. Amen? For the Lord, verse 13, for the Lord hath chosen Zion, he hath desired it for his habitation. This is my rest forever. Here will I dwell, for I have desired it. And so when Christ comes, he's going to build God a house in Jerusalem because that's where God has desired to dwell. Amen. Say, so what's this got to do with the book of Matthew? Son of David, son of Abraham. That's the man that came into the world in the book of Matthew. A man that God had promised an everlasting covenant, everlasting possession, an everlasting throne. And so Christ is going to come. God is going to establish his kingdom. He's going to build a house for his name. And God will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father and he shall be my son. Psalm 2, 6 through 8. The son came. You know what happened when the son showed up? The heathen raged and the people imagined a vain thing. The rulers, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers took counsel together against the Lord and his anointed. And they took the son of God and did with him as they would whatsoever they wanted to do with him. 
And God says, yet, yet. You see, they imagine something vain. They can't cast off God's son. They can't break his bands asunder. They can't get themselves out from under his authority. They killed him and God said, in spite of your best efforts, yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me. This is Christ talking. Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine what? And the uttermost parts of the earth for thy what? Boy, it just keeps getting more and more, don't it? Now what's he get? The heathen and the uttermost parts of the what? For his what? So Christ gets possession of the uttermost parts of the earth. You see in this? This is the man that was born about 2,000 years ago that rose from the dead and is now seated at the right hand of God that not 90% of all of humanity ever thinks about. And whether you think about him or not, as Paul said in Romans, that he was separated under the gospel of God concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Do you know what Lord is? It's a title of possession. You call landowners lords. Do you know who Jesus Christ is? He's the possessor of heaven and earth. God has put all authority, all power in heaven and earth under his feet. Whether you think about him, whether you ignore him, whether you acknowledge him, he's your Lord. Amen? The man, Christ Jesus, the Son of God, Possessor of heaven and earth. Isaiah 2.2, 2, it shall come to pass when? That the mountain of the Lord's what? Shall be established in the top of the mountains and, he, and, it, and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. What? This mountain of the Lord's house. He's coming back. The Lord Jesus is coming back. And he is going to build God a house in the mountain that God chose. And all nations are going to come up to that mountain to learn the ways of the God of Jacob. And if they don't come up, God shuts the heavens up and it don't rain. Just like he did Israel under the law. You know what that tells me? The nations are under a schoolmaster in the millennial kingdom. The law of Israel is going to be taught to the nations of the world. They're going to be under tutors and governors just like Israel was. Amen. Now thank God you and I are sons. Amen. But the nations are going to be under this kingdom. He's going to rule them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Amen. Y'all understanding this son of David, son of Abraham. They go back to specific promises that was made to Abraham and David about their seed. And Christ is that son. And all these promises that were made to those men about their seed are in this man right here. God's going to establish his kingdom. Nobody else's. Nobody's. Not America, not China, Russia. Every war in this world is in vanity. That man's kingdom is going to be established. In fact, look at Psalm 45, man. We could talk about this stuff all day. Go, go home and read the Psalms, man, if you want to understand this stuff.
Look at verse 1. My heart is indicting a good matter. I speak of the things which I have made touching the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. Thou art fairer than the children of men. Grace is poured into thy lips. Therefore God hath blessed thee. For what? Who do you think this is about? Gird thy sword upon thy thigh, O most mighty, and with thy glory and thy majesty. Now guys, I picture this stuff, man. When Christ went back to heaven, God said, sit at my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. Psalm 45, he looks at him and says, gird your sword on your thigh. Arise, my son. Go take possession of what's yours. Amen. Can't you imagine? Can you imagine the scene in heaven when the Son of God arises from his seated position and begins to put on his battle armor and goes and mounts up on a white horse and looks at the armies of heaven and say, let's go, boys. <laughs> I know what's going to be going on in heaven, shouting. And the earth is going to begin to tremble. That Bible says that they're going to wail and moan when they look upon him. When he comes in the clouds, the whole fa every family of this earth is going to wail and weep because of him. The kings and the mighty men are going to run into the mountains and say, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth upon the throne. <sighs> you ever read stuff like that and just stop and just think? That's going to happen one day. Look at what he tells him in verse 4. In thy majesty, ride prosperously because of truth and meekness and righteousness and thy right hand shall teach thee what? He's saying, son, when you ride through the earth, you ride for truth and meekness and righteousness. And because of that, his right hand is going to teach him to do terrible things. Because when he comes, he's not going to find truth and righteousness and meekness. When he comes, the Bible says in Revelation 19, that he comes in righteousness to judge and to make war. <laughs> oh man, when the Son of God comes to make war, you better watch out. Amen? And no wonder the United States spends uh, 850 some billion dollars a year on the defense. Maybe they know something they ain't telling y'all. It ain't enough. Trying to fortify the world, setting up military bases all over, trying to fortify the world for the devil to try to hold on to his stronghold. When the Son of God, listen, it ain't going to take many. That Bible says when the Son of God comes, he's going to destroy them with the spirit of his mouth and consume them with the brightness of his coming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, boy. Mm. Don't you love this stuff? Verse 5, thine arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies, whereby the people fall under thee. Now watch this. Remember that eternal throne? Remember the everlasting throne? Look at verse 6. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. What did God call his throne? Thy throne, O what? God. The writer of Hebrews quotes that just so you don't miss it. And he says, To which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. What's he say about the angels? He maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. But under the sun he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever. That's God talking to the sun right there. Thy throne, O God. When Jesus Christ comes and sets upon the throne of David, that throne becomes the throne of God. Amen? 
And so, summary. Then we'll pick up with John the Baptist in the morning service. Summary of this. Number one, Abraham was promised a seed out of his own bowels. And then he's told to take that only seed and offer it unto God as a burnt offering. But then he's told that God is going to make a provision in the stead of Isaac. That provision was the Lord Jesus Christ, the seed of Abraham. And after that, he tells Abraham, because you've not withheld your only son from me, I'm going to multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven and as the sands of the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gates of his enemies. Amen. So that one single seed, Jesus Christ, came, died on the mountain that God told Abraham of, was buried and rose again, and God greatly multiplied that man. If you're saved, he's in you. None of us are living by the law or anything. We are all living by the faith of the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. Amen. Amen. And through that multiplied seed, that seed is going to take possession of heaven and earth one day. Amen. Amen. Then... He tells Abraham, or he tells David, that his seed is going to be his son and that God is going to establish his kingdom and that his seed, his son, is going to build God a house and God is going to establish the throne of that kingdom forever and ever. Amen? Look at Jeremiah 31 real quick. Remember that everlasting covenant that God said he was going to make with Abraham and his seed. You know, this stuff we're talking about here, guys, this is the stuff Christ rebuked the Sadducees for, for being stupid about the resurrection. Did God promise to be, to make an everlasting covenant with Abraham and his seed? To be a God unto him and his seed? That's Christ telling the Sadducees, you err not knowing the scriptures. How can God be a God to Abraham if he's dead? God is going to raise Abraham up and be a, make an everlasting covenant with them and be unto them a God forever. Amen? This is the very things Christ is rebuking them for. Look at Jeremiah 31. Well, Come back to Jeremiah 30 real quick. I just want to show you something. Look at verse 3. See the days come. Y'all see that? Look at, look at 30 and 7. See that day? Look at, look at, look at verse 7 again. See the time of Jacob's trouble? Look at verse 8. It shall come to pass in that what? Okay. Look down at verse chapter 31 and verse 1. At the same what? At the same what? Okay. Look down in, uh, look down in verse 27 of chapter 31. See, behold, the days come. Look at verse 29. In those what? Verse 31, behold the days what? Look at verse 33. You see, after those days, now let me, tell, let me ask you something. Let me ask y'all an honest question. Is there any excuse for men to have that kind of information in possession and be ignorant concerning the new covenant? Days come, that day, time of Jacob's trouble, after those days, in those days, in that day, at the same time. It's inexcusable. It's inexcusable for a bunch of Christians running around claiming they're under the new covenant when it's clearly going to be made after those days. And it's made with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. 
End of story. Amen? That's why Paul never preached it. And it's not mentioned till you get to the book of Hebrews. Because God said he was going to make this covenant with Abraham in his, and his seed in their generations. It's circumcision. It's about the family of Abraham. You Gentiles were strangers and aliens to those things. When God sent a man to you, he sent him with the gospel of the uncircumcision. And you better learn the differences. You're not Israel. You're not getting that land. You're not, that's none of it. Those things belong to that family and that people. Christ came to confirm those promises. If you want to learn about your calling and election, I advise you to read the book of Ephesians. And quit trying to rob Israel and make a liar out of God. You got these people running around, oh, I don't agree with replacement theology. Then you listen to them preach. And they can't tell you anything about you without robbing Israel. They steal their marriage, their baptism. They steal their covenant, everything. Their land. We're coming back on white horses. Amen, brother. Yep. Preach. Now, don't tell me you're not a replacement theologian then everything you preach is you replacing Israel. Talk is cheap, man. I know exactly what we've been called for. This, uh, this seed of Abraham, all this stuff right here. There was part, there was things about Christ that was not revealed. It's all about Him. The mystery is not about the Gentiles. The mystery is not about the Jews. The mystery of Christ. It's the mystery of Christ. Things about the Lord Jesus Christ that God never spoke in, in time past. And there's things about that seed and that man and his inheritance that God kept secret and that he elected us for before the foundation of the world and kept it secret and hid in himself. I thank God for it, man. People get all bent out of shape about this stuff. Preacher, why you got to talk about it all the time? Why you got to talk about it all the time? Because it's the Bible. It's the Bible, man. And so what I want you to get is that Matthew... Matthew is dealing with this seed of Abraham and the seed of David that God made promises to and he's coming, he's now showed up, he's been born and he's now going to go offer himself as a burnt offering and then God is going to raise him from the dead, set him at his own right hand and when the time comes, the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back, God's going to establish his kingdom He's going to make an everlasting covenant with Israel. They're going to take possession of the land promised to their fathers. And Christ is going to sit upon the throne of his father David. And he's going to possess the heathen and the uttermost parts of the earth for his possession. And he's going to build a house of God in Jerusalem. And the nations are going to go up to the house of the Lord. And they're going to be taught the ways of the God of Jacob. And they're going to walk in his ways. And he's going to judge between the nations. It's like I said here Wednesday night, man, and I'll be done. You'll have the body of Christ judging the angels. You'll have the 12 tribes of Israel judging, or the 12 apostles judging the 12 tribes. You'll have the 144,000 out among the nations. But it says the Lord is going to judge among the nations. And it says that they will learn of war no more. You know what that means? When nations get into a dispute, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to judge between them. They're not going to go to war anymore. They're going to take it up to Jerusalem and the Lord Jesus Christ is going to judge between those nations and they're not going to learn war anymore. He's going to settle the issue. Amen?
<laughs> Ain't you looking forward to that? You know, there's nothing, there's nothing more hypocritical than a bunch of armed troops going into a nation calling themselves peacekeepers. Amen? That's how, that's how man keeps peace, at gunpoint. UN, UN going in, the United Nations peacekeeping forces. That's just like man, isn't it? They couldn't tell the truth if they had to. Send in a bunch of soldiers with, with, with tanks and machine guns and, and missiles and then call themselves peacekeepers. Yeah, okay. Lord Jesus Christ, when he gets done judging, they're going to turn, they're going to take all their weapons of full war and turn them into pruning hooks and plowshares. They're going to grow food instead of killing one another. Amen? Isn't that sad that you got all this starvation in the world and America spends $800 billion on weaponry? Come on. While paying farmers not to grow food. What in the world is wrong with man? When Christ comes, man, every man's going to sit under a vineyard. Hey, Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus, right? Amen. Brother Eric closes out. We'll pick up with the rest of this guys in the morning service. We're going to talk about John the Baptist ministry this morning. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your holy word, God. We ask that anyone that hears this word, that their ears are open, that their hearts are glorified, God. We just love you so much, Lord. We pray for the second service. Paul's had a little sleep. Just quicken them by your spirit. Give them strength in his inner man just to preach with boldness. Give them great utterance, Lord. And help us to receive these things. Help us to understand them. Help them to speak just plainly, God, so that we can be edified by your word. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen.